Many old houses have treasures in the attic, but few have such a treasure trove as this. Jim Flanagan, you might say, is a cornerstone of Belique Potteries, responsible for the maintenance of buildings and machinery and his father before him. All earthenware, sound and good, basins with gilded wastes, patented plate warmers, only waiting to be filled from a kettle of hot water, and old hotel and railway company ware, carrying the dust of over a hundred years. Belik is set up 130 years ago in industry that was also a work of art, and that over all those years provided employment for generations of craftsmen, and that still flourishes, and that is still a matter of national pride. The name of Belik is known around the world. Up in the north, as myself and many another can truly testify, we are all very conscious and were conscious and from an early age of the name of Belik. If the cups you were using at table were Belik, even the earthenware, you were pointedly reminded of that. When distinguished visitors called, the delicate Belik china was produced and commented on, and the praise was duly and proudly accepted. Remembering Loch Hearn, the poet William Allingham wrote of the loch that winds through islands under Turaw Mountain Green and Castle Colwell stretching woods with tranquil bays between. The home of John Colwell Bloomfield, the last of the Colwell dynasty, a good and improving landlord, a type not too often found in the Ireland of his time, with a genuine concern for the people of the area who had suffered so cruelly from the famine. He was an amateur chemist and was fortunate to discover deposits of kaolin and felspar on his estate, the principal ingredients of porcelain. The felspar was quarried, ground up and could be mixed with the china clay. He also had the good fortune to meet Robert Williams Armstrong, an engineer, architect and ceramic historian. Quite by accident, it is told, when the two of them were browsing around a Dublin antique shop. It was the genius of Armstrong that helped to design the new pottery building and machinery. The mighty Erne, at that time and in that place, one of the most powerful rivers in Europe that was to supply the power and dictated the site of the pottery at Belique, in Irish, Bail Llaca, the ford of the flagstone. The pottery finally opened in July 1857, choosing for its trademark Wolfhound, Harp and the Devonish Round Tower.
In the morning, Perry and Weir are still hot from the kilns, is gathered. That fine word Perry and we owe to the Greek island of Pharos, where in classical times a fine white marble was quarried. Nowadays, the Balik clay body is made up of china clay from Cornwall, ground feldspar from Norway, and frit, a type of manufactured ground glass. It is added to water and blended for several hours in a huge ball mill, in the same way as flour is added to milk in a pancake mix. The slip, as it is now called, passes through the sieving unit, where lawns hold back lumps of undissolved clay and over a series of electromagnetic bars which remove particles of iron which would oxidize during the first firing and appear as rusty specks on the china. Slip has the consistency of thick cream. The mill room with its heavy machinery is located on the ground floor. Then begins the long haul to the Perian workshops. Sean Coyle's first task every morning is to cast whatever article he is currently producing from the working molds. He stirs the slip to remove air bubbles that could affect the reproduction of the design which is embossed on the inside of the molds. The delicate translucency of Balik China is the result of the skilled judgment of the caster, determined by how long the slip is allowed to remain in the mold, building up the walls of the article before the excess is poured away to be reused. The piece has to remain in the mould curing until it is strong enough to support itself. As it sits, the clay shrinks slightly, releasing itself from the design. At this stage it is known as greenware and is very, very fragile. This is the body of a teapot. The larger the article, the longer the curing. In this instance, about two to three hours, but it can't be left over long in the mould or it would become too dry for the next stage. Liam McCauley assembles all the parts that go to make up a teapot. Spouts and handles are cast separately. Approximately 40 pieces can be cast from a working mould before it becomes worn. Clay selvage is carefully removed where it has overflowed the pattern, but it won't be wasted, as we shall see. To my ignorant eye, this looks a little like tap dancing on the railings on top of the Eiffel Tower. What would happen if... Sean Boyle has worked for 35 years in the pottery. His father was a kiln man in the days of the bottle kills, when all the ware was coal-fired. The coal was delivered by train right into the pottery yard, on a branch line off the main Enniskill and Bundoran line. Gussie McGonigal joined the pottery on exactly the same day, the 22nd of June, 1951. They used to have a lift in the pottery, but the vibration was so extreme it scattered the ware in all directions. Fettling is the process of piecing the parts together and making good seams and joints. In those long, dreaming summers when I was a boy in Oma, American aunts and uncles came to revisit the scenes of their youth. What they wanted most always to bring back with them began with Belit China and Belfast linen. 
and went on as far as mountain heather, white or purple, or the branch of some blossoming tree recalled from boyhood or girlhood. In Crawford and Wilson's great hardware store in Oma, there was one large window devoted entirely to the display of the produce of Balik. And townspeople and country people and visitors from elsewhere used to stand gazing at it as if it were a wayside altar shrine. Liam Macaulay is a good representative of the strong family traditions that have always been maintained in this place. He is of the fourth generation of his family to work here. There was an ancestor present even at the building of the pottery. He was working on the pediment, when, as the story goes, he took an unscheduled trip to the ground. The lucky man, though, landed on his feet, and the great Armstrong ran to him, gave him a glass of whiskey, and sent him back up the ladder. The clay is still damp, and the articles have to be kept that way, or it would not be possible to piece them together. The same slip is used, thickened with common salt, to disguise the joints and stick the pieces together. Now, the way to describe their state is like butter and cheese. They are butter soft, coming out of the moulds, and cheese hard for joining and fettling the removal of the seams, and the sharpening up of the designs. At this stage, the teapot goes to a nearby drying room to spend the night. The following morning, Liam will make its lid, but today he moves on to a batch he made yesterday. A finished ware is carried to the large drying rooms adjacent to the kills, or brought to the flowering shop to receive applied decoration. Aparian workers are paid by the piece. Liam can, on average, finish 22 teapots a day, and 100 to 110 in a working week. Albert Elliot works in what is known as the middle or special shop, where newly designed pieces are cast and carefully assembled for the first time. This is the range of parry in China called springtime, about to be launched by the pottery. It is also in this shop that old pieces, out of production for perhaps 50 years, are reintroduced. These are lithophanes, first designed about 1908. Slip is carefully poured over the surface of the mould. It is allowed to cure and is skillfully scraped as thin as safety will allow. Another wit and with extreme care it is blown from the mould. Another Macaulay, Vincent, a cousin of Liam's. Lithophanes like stained glass are designed to be backlit. St. Patrick's Cathedral, New York, before the skyscrapers were built around it. It is here in the design and modeling studio that the work truly begins. Fergus Cleary creates an entirely new piece for the Balik collection. Once it has been designed and drawn on paper, a solid model is made in plaster of Paris. 
But first, the profilers turned on the lath. There has always been a long tradition of fine modellers in the pottery. William Gallimore was the first, a chief modeller of Gossus, Stoke on Trent. He was invited to Belik by Robert Williams Armstrong in 1857. Armstrong also influenced the design of some of the early pieces, and his wife, formerly Annie Langley Nairn, who was a noted watercolourist, with a genuine feeling for nature, is credited with the design of a number of the early botanical and marine subjects, many of which are still produced today by Belik. The hand carving of the model is a lengthy and meticulous task. This piece will take ten working days. Working from his drawing, Fergus has accurately to reproduce the design in the soft plaster. Fergus's grandfather, James Cleary, was also a modeller. He was trained by William Gallimore, after the latter lost his right arm in a shooting accident. And some of the Belique China is named after the Cleary family. His grandfather went on to become the first Belique-born manager in 1884. His brother, Edward Cleary, succeeded him in 1900. The model is liberally coated in soft soap to prepare it for the mould making and to prevent the plaster of Paris from sticking to it. A template is made to form an accurate division between the two halves of the mould and will act as a shuttering to contain the plaster. Cotling, a strange word for the piece of material which goes over the top of the mould to further contain the plaster. Once mixed, the plaster of Paris must be used quickly. It sets hard in a matter of minutes. When one half is completed, the same operation follows for the other half and the bottom of the mould. Now the hard edges have to be removed from the mould to make it a pleasing shape and good to handle. The mould is made in three parts, the bottom and the two sides, to facilitate the removal of the model. This is the master mould which carries the negative image from the model on the inside. The master mould will now be passed on to the mould making shop where the master case mould will be made as we shall see. The first trial piece out of the working mould, with additional piercing by Fergus. 
The production line, you might say, for the pottery begins here, in the mould-making shop, where the working moulds for casting the final pieces are made. But to understand this sequence better, we must go back to the master mould, which has come from Fergus Cleary. From this master mould, a master case mould is made in a specially hard casting plaster. The master mould is the white uppermost section. From this positive master case mould can be reproduced the many working moulds. On the left is the model and beside it the master mould made by Fergus Cleary in three sections. Next the positive master case mould. From that can be made the many working moulds used for casting the final piece. Perhaps it is not fully realised what a diverse range of ware Balik has produced over the years, from the finest porcelain to common ware, even to telephone insulators. These fine old copper plates now, which have recently come to light, were used to transfer the design onto earthenware by means of lithography. The plates were coated in mineral paint, placed in a mangle press, the design transferred onto paper and to the ware, which was glazed and fired. One might be excused from thinking that our story had taken an irreversible plunge into the preparation of some exotic dish for the table, though gum arabic is one of the main ingredients of chewing gum. Nonetheless, Joe Leonard knows the ingredients are refined and pure. Perian scraps saved from the Fettler's bench. No sifted flour, this, but slip selvage, dry as dust. Gum Arabic, by the way, is the product of an African tree, Acacia Senegal.
And this is highly reminiscent to me of the fancy bread department in the model bakery in Oma long ago. The dough, like clay, will be used for the making of baskets and flowers rather than for the baking of the staff of life. The clay gets a cudgeling with oaken beakers to drive out the disruptive air bubbles. Then the dot of clay is put into a hand-operated extrusion press. John Dugan, a basket maker and flourer, is about to make a large oval lidded basket. The spaghetti like strands or rods from the extrusion press supply his raw material. The all-important gum arabic adds to the plasticity and flexibility of the clay and without it the task would be impossible. William Henschel is credited with introducing basket and flower making to Balik. He came over from Stoke-on-Trent in 1865 and was one of the few craftsmen who did not return to England. He stayed to roam the banks of the Erne till the end of his life, and in fact his descendants still live in the locality. Little did anyone realize at that time just what an impact his baskets were to have in spreading the fame and adding to the fortune of Balik worldwide. He was a man of flair and ingenuity. The Perian baskets required considerable research in the perfecting of techniques and in the trial firings. All this was overseen by Robert Williams Armstrong, that general manager who was tireless in his search for the perfect Balik clay body. It took about six years of experimentation after the pottery opened for Armstrong to achieve this and produce a small amount of quality Perian. For he was quick to realize that although they were producing superior earthenware, to win international acclaim, the pottery must produce Perian. The adhesive is the same clay slip, thickened with salt, with water added, that was used by the fettlers in the Perian workshop. As in any long surviving business, and Balik is after all a business, there have been times of strain and crisis, and of renewal and new directions. The two world wars, as one might readily expect, posed their problems, for in times of madness and destruction, it is the beautiful things in life or, if you care to put it this way, the ornamentations that suffer first. During the Second World War, Perian production all but ceased. No china clay and a shortage of coal to fire the kilns at the higher temperature required for porcelain. The pottery switched to making earthenware, commonware, from what little clay they had, and were reduced still further to making handleless mugs. Vincent Macaulay tells of the Thrupney bit sale that took place in the pottery in the late 1930s under the shadow of another war. For threepence a piece, he says, you could take away as much china as you could carry. It was open to everyone, and people in the locality for years and years had so much china they didn't know what to do with it. They even took it out and buried it. And he says, I've seen it myself broken to make wee path roads into the houses.
finest olive oil to prevent the gum arabic in the clay from sticking to the fingers. The craftsmen make all their own tools from a variety of items, a six-inch nail, the handle of a spoon, and even the stay of an old corset. Armstrong writes in his journal that he thought that by 1869, the pottery's Parian creations had advanced to perfection. And Queen Victoria, or whoever looked after those things for her, wanted them, and the Prince of Wales, and the Duke of Abercorn, who was and is a good local man, and the Earls of Arran and Erne and Enniskillen, and not unnaturally many others followed suit. And Queen Victoria presented a tea service to the German royal family, and I have heard it said that there is Balik China in the Kremlin. It must have got there in the days of the Tsars, for I never did hear that Lenin was much given to Perian. Not all the floral delights end up on baskets. They are also laid on selected cast pieces. The bird's nest tree stump vase that Jerry Dolan is working on is one of the older Balik designs. There are 140 employees in the pottery, which makes it by far the biggest employer in the district. And being in a rural area, most of the craftsmen are part-time farmers. The base of the basket has now spent a night in the drying room and is strong enough to support itself. It is far less fragile than the cast Perian because of the addition of gum arabic, but must still be handled with care. There were good times, there were bad times. Balik has enjoyed the good times and endured the bad ones. In the hungry thirties the workers suffered. A single horse cart of turf fetched five shillings in Ballyshannon, twice as much as two weeks' wages in the pottery, and that's only 25 pence today. In 1946, an important event took place. New coal-fired bottle ovens were installed that could efficiently maintain the higher temperature required for Perian. At the same time, there was a revived and insatiable demand for Perian. Earthenware production ceased, and the pottery was to concentrate on the more lucrative Perry in China, and has done so ever since. John Dugan is here in Balik for just over ten years. Five of that as an apprentice, and he says he is still learning. He's unusual, you might say, in that he's the first and only member of his family to work here. Ten years of carefully creating these elegant baskets. His father carried the post in the neighborhood. In five working days, John can make two large oval baskets, working from one to the other according to the state of the clay. That's a lot of baskets in ten years. Ruffle stuff is clay that has been pressed through copper gauze and dried.
This minute mould for casting the leaves of the roses is also made by John from powdered sulphur added to hot water to form a paste and made into a mould. A basket of this size will have literally hundreds of individual parts. The larger flowers with delicate stems are dried before laying on. Each basket is unique, entirely handmade from start to finish. Each one will carry its own individual and registered number. This, with a record of the date of its completion, will be kept in the Belique Pottery files. John Keown is serving his five years apprenticeship to the craft, and this is one of his tasks. He will also spend time making flowers. And Jim Flanagan, qualified electrician, historian, and Balik Fire Brigade chief, is fitting a new element into the electric kiln prior to firing. Tremendous care and attention is paid to the preparation of the baskets for the first biscuit firing. They are placed in a sagar made from fire clay and surrounded by carborundum grit. Sand supports the bigger baskets. The grit and sand are refractory materials. Their melting point is high. They will help to maintain a constant temperature around the basket during and after firing and will not stick to the perion. A hollow unfired plug made from perion slip and fine clay supports the lid. Special fiberglass supports the delicate handles. And it's vital that lid and base be fired together so that both will shrink at the same rate. Alumina powder will prevent a perian cup from sticking to its ring during firing. Harps get the same treatment. The sagar or outer shield protects the article from a sudden blast of cold air when the kiln is opened. That would cause it to become dunted or cracked. Larger items, such as the baskets, are carefully placed in the centre of the truck where the kiln temperature will be most uniform. The articles, though white, are still technically referred to as greenware before firing. Every working day there are firings at Balik. A rigid timetable must be adhered to. At 4.25 in the afternoon, the trucks roll into the kilns. The doors close and firing begins. Within six hours, the temperature will have risen to 1,120 degrees centigrade and will be held for a further six hours throughout the night, known as the soak or slow period.
The following morning, Vincent Dolan, in charge of the firing, opens the damper to release the heat. This will gradually bring down the temperature. Now the door can be cracked, that is, opened fractionally. A sudden rush of cold air could fracture the wear, could indeed cause havoc. The total firing takes 12 hours and the wear must be allowed time to cool before it can be handled. After the first firing, it is known as biscuit wear because of its pale, biscuity colour. It will have contracted by as much as 40%. The baskets are brought away then for a minute and thorough inspection. The more robust Perian passes through the Vibro Energy Mill, where thousands of small wooden cubes jostle the wear, scouring away specks of sand and alumina and smoothing the edges. Quality control down to the most minute detail is close to the heart of Belique policy as are also the two words, no seconds. The ware is now ready to be dipped in the glaze. The beautiful blue colour comes from a vegetable dye added purely to show up any mist areas. The excess has to be thoroughly shaken or blown off. Too much glaze could cause an unwanted greenish tinge to be present in the glaze and possible crazing after the second firing. The glaze contains lead frit, a safe form of lead, china clay and ground flint. Infrared lamps dry the glaze to enable it to be handled without fingerprints marking it. The base is wiped free of glaze to prevent it from sticking to the bottom of the kiln. The ware is carried to the kiln room where the glossed firing takes place. This will impart the exquisite pearly sheen so characteristic of Belique Perry in China. For many, a Belique basket in its delicate ivory tinted glaze is perfection. Others prefer a subtle hint of colour. Basket wear, particularly the larger baskets, are hard to find on the open market, such as the demand. In the calm oasis of the painting and decorating shop, Greta O'Loughlin plies her brush. The famous trademark, without which none is genuine. Only Perian that has been painted gets a third or enamel firing at the much lower temperature of 700 degrees centigrade for seven hours. John Dugan follows his creation all the way through. He says, I get a great sense of relief and satisfaction when I see it come out of the kill and everything is okay. The least wee mark on it and it has to be broken. The busy female hands pack the delicate china ready for yet another journey, though not this time 
within the confines of the pottery, but much, much further afield, departing like the kinfolk of those visiting aunts and uncles to distant shores. The sea at its own craftsmanship, the sea that so much inspired Annie Langley Nairn. And craftsmen here at Balik have taken inspiration and colours from the beauty of the urn, from the woods on its shore, and the flowers of the field and the birds of the air, and from the changing colour of the sea breaking on Tullam Strand, level and long and white with waves where gull and curlew stand. Personally, I'm very proud of the pottery. I've worked there now most of my life. We have an association our family with the pottery since 1868. When I go away throughout Ireland or to foreign fields and ask where I'm from, and I say I'm from a little village called Balik, oh, yes, you'll be told that's where the pottery is made. It makes you feel very proud that our little village is so widely known and famed, and this is all due to Balik pottery. My family have been involved with Belique for over a hundred years. I have a great sense of history of the place and then also with my particular job as a modeler here, I occasionally come across pieces that my own grandfather has modeled and I wonder what way he would have gone about it. <laughs> 